This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Big college football playoff implications on the line in week number 12. We're going to break down some of those key games with Brett McMurphy of the Action Network getting his read on those games and talking about college football betting in general in what should be a fun week across the nation. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here once again by Dr. Ed Feng. Check out Ed on Twitter at The Power Rank. Check out his work at ThePowerRank.com. And Ed, following week of college football coming up, how you doing? I'm doing pretty well. I'm still stunned at how much Oregon's offense just ground to a stop when Bo Nix got hurt for a series. But uh, Washington with a huge win and Oregon's loss clearly helps uh, some of the Big Ten teams out here in my area. Yeah. Definitely does. And you call you had a Washington plus 13 and a half for that game too. That doesn't hurt uh, either as well. But we're joined as mentioned by Brett McMurphy. You can find Brett on Twitter at Brett underscore McMurphy. If you somehow do not already follow him there, his work is over at the action network where he is a college football insider and Brett got the new CFP rankings last night. Got a fun slate on tap for week 12. How are you doing today? Great. Good to be with you guys. Uh, Ed, I've been an admirer of your work from afar. Uh, good, good to meet you in person and good to be with you, Jim. It's always uh, fun. Every college football guest we have on immediately like has to like talk about Ed stuff, which I appreciate. Always makes me very happy <laughs> inside. Um, Ed is the best. So I, I, I echo, echo those sentiments as well. We're going to break down all of college football week 12 and get Brett's thoughts, not just on those games, but also on the unique perspective that he has uh, with betting college football games in just a second. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. Of course, Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Amazon Podcasts. We are there. Search for Covering the Spread. Hit subscribe. And if you like what you hear, leave us a rating and review as well. Twisted Tea and FanDuel have joined forces to bring you a one-of-a-kind contest series that gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in site credit. Introducing Twisted Tea's College Football Picks, a sports betting-focused contest series that's entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned a money line the spread and total market with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, you'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head to FanDuel.com slash Twisted T Picks and make your picks. And remember, please drink responsibly. Now, Brett, it's fun to have you on the show for today because Ed and I both come at this from a, a, a numbers perspective. That's where our background is. But you've got a super unique perspective, not just relative to us, but also relative to most of the betting industry as a journalist. So how does that background help inform the way you view betting on college football? Uh, probably the biggest thing is never believe anything a coach says in a press conference. <laughs> <laughs> I know I've talked to, uh, you know, Stucky and Colin that work with me at the action network when we're having, when we're on a call or doing a podcast and they'll say, uh, coach, coach X, Y, Z said this, this week. Yeah. And I'm like, guys, d he's lying. Don't listen to him. <laughs> it's not specifically one coach. It's basically every coach college coaches specifically. I'm not talking NFL college coaches specifically are the most paranoid coaches on this planet and they are not going to give an ounce of information out that they think may help their team and one great example is and and look i'm an oklahoma state alum so i'm, I'm not dissing anybody but my own alma mater oklahoma state hosted espn college game day a few years ago usually the way you do it is when the broadcast team comes in the day before the game you meet with them you go over injuries and the agreement is, look, here's the skinny, but you can't announce it until right, right before kickoff. Pretty right. much everybody will do that. Well, Oklahoma State had a starting quarterback with a broken leg. Oklahoma State did not reveal that to any of the pre-broadcast pre meetings. College game day was there. No one at ESPN knew about it. ESPN's televising the game kickoff. Here comes the starting lineup. The quarterback's not in the lineup. They you know, reach out to the PR guys. Hey, what's going on? Why isn't he yeah. in there? Oh, it's senior day. We're starting the senior. Okay, that's fine. Now <laughs> it's in the now it's in the second quarter, and the guy's still not in there. 
they're finally they say, oh, yeah, he's not playing. He's got a broken leg. So, um, <laughs> wow. You know, some coaches are really paranoid about that. They think it's a big advantage or disadvantage. Others, you know, aren't aren't as uh, paranoid, I guess. Some coaches actually will be very, you know, upfront and honest. It's very rare that you see that. Um, but I've talked to guys, you know, that I worked with at ESPN and other places that cover college football and then cover the NFL. And they're like, Brett, man, NFL is like a total, yeah, totally right. different atmosphere. You walk in and they're like, okay, here's the deal. This guy's hurt. This guy's this, 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 this. There's no hiding anything. So uh, I guess a uh, long-winded answer is when you hear a coach on a Tuesday press conference talking, I do the opposite because <laughs> he's not telling you the truth. That's fascinating. Jim and I were talking before the show about KJ Jefferson and how he didn't play for Arkansas. Yeah, perfect example. Remember? Yeah, when did that come out? We were we didn't know exactly when that news came out. Uh, I had heard about it early in the week, but I couldn't confirm it. Um, yeah. And then yeah. I think about 20 minutes before kickoff, I com confirmed it and, okay. and tweeted that he was definitely out. Okay. Um, you know, there's there's been a lot of quarterbacks this year, especially in college football, where yeah. You know, the uncertainty. Spencer Sanders is a perfect example. Yeah. You know, I reported the past two weeks he wouldn't play. Uh, they, they've they alternated with the freshman quarterbacks. Sanders wasn't supposed to play last week, but basically they needed him. And he said, you know, look, I'm not 100 percent. I'll come in there and play. The idea was to rest him for this week's Bedlam game against Oklahoma. But, yeah, Ed, there's been tons and tons of quarterback uh, intrigue and mystery and basically the college coaches don't want to show their hand. They want the yeah. opposing team to prepare for both quarterbacks, whether that works or not. If you want to run the numbers on that and get no, back I mean, to me, I doubt it really makes a big impact, but the college coaches feel like it does. I mean, the quarterback is certainly one player that's going to move the market. Jim and I were talking about whether, you know, LSU going from three to three and a half was the result of announcing the Jefferson injury. It seems like not because I think it closed at three and a half. So there was no extra bump. Well, it closed at six. Oh, okay. I think that was probably after Brett's tweet, to be fully honest. I think it got to six eventually. Yeah, it oh. moved. And, and also, that was a weird game because LSU was in this, as you guys know, they were in the flattest spot, you know, known yeah, to mankind. Right. So that's probably why it didn't move more. Um, but yeah, it, it did move there at the end. Yeah, okay. Jefferson, I think, like, warmed up. I think Colin was tweeting about it. I thought I saw a tweet from him on Saturday. Yeah, and that's the that's the other thing I've noticed. Um, this happened with Michael Pratt, quarterback of Tulane. That happened with K.J. Jefferson. Now, when you have quarterbacks that are injured, you Warm see up. them come out and take yeah. first-team reps in pregame. Yeah. And then they oh, go wow. back into the locker room and come out, and <laughs> they're wearing street clothes. You know? I mean, you can't install a game plan in 90 minutes. So, like, yeah, exactly. I, I get it. I, I get it. But it seems a little bit on the paranoid side of things. Now, that could be one thing, you know, that you notice is people putting stock into what coaches say in press conferences. But are there other things you observe when you're consuming betting content, you're talking with betters? Are you think are there things that you think we as betters either over or undervalue when we're trying to bet these games based on what you've seen and based on your knowledge of the sport? I mean, obviously, it's a case by case basis. <clears throat> I think maybe a lot of people that are into analytics, I know Colin is real big numbers guys. I think sometimes they don't take into consideration the motivational aspects, sure. especially at the college level. Um, the NFL, I think, is a whole different animal. But for the college level, it's just it's impossible to have great games back to back weeks. Um, it just is. It's you, you don't see that for 18 to 22 year olds yeah. and everybody can say all the right things. You know, we're not looking past this game, yada, yada, yada. But I think that's the biggest thing is, is to look at some of these perceived flat spots and see if, you know, if the team looks like they can take advantage of it. Um, that's what I would look at. I mean, I tend to look at that more than, uh, than a numbers guy. I'm not a numbers guy. I'm not going to pretend I am one. But, um, you know, basically just kind of more motivational. Also, you know, having done this for a while, I know which coaches don't like other coaches. <laughs> so if there's a scenario where this game could get out of hand, is this guy potentially right. going to run it up? Or the flip side, do the, is there a great deal of respect between these guys? Sure. Will they this guy not run it up on him? So that kind of stuff helps, you know, when, kind of when you're shaping, you know, what's your, how you actually view the, uh, the game. 
Let's uh let's get back. I I, I like the motivation bit because I had kind of talked myself into LSU having enough motivation, obviously coming off a huge emotional win over arch rival and evil empire Alabama the week before, but they still had an sec West title to play for. So that was kind of like, how are you going to fall flat on your face now? Right? Like, you know, your division's tough. You have a chance to win it. I thought the motivation was there. Was your take different? Yeah. I loved Arkansas. I did. I did. I loved Arkansas. Um, and again, <laughs> here's another, I don't, again, if you want to run the numbers, I'd love to see what the the number is for teams after they tear down the goalpost. You, know, <laughs> you, you can say, you can say they're playing for the sec West and they are um, perfect example is Kansas. You know, look at Kansas and what they've done this year. Incredible job by Lance Leipold. They get to six wins. They get bowl eligibility for the first time. They rush the field. They tear down the goalpost. It looks like they're, they've won another national title in basketball. And then what happens? They go play at Texas Tech. Texas Tech beats them. You know, yeah. that game's played earlier in the year. Um, probably goes down to the wire. Texas Tech won, won pretty handedly. Uh, again, you know, the, the pace of the game, turnovers, different things. But, Ed, that's kind of the things I look at like that. You know, Kansas hasn't been bowl eligible in – uh 15 16 years whatever the number is you know they just won this game they're going to celebrate they're going to celebrate it's hard to get that same emotion and everything going into that next game now it's obviously not a hundred percent um but it's just something to you know kind of keep your eye on when you're when you're breaking down these games each week got a also, couple can... of homework assignments right i like this this is good <laughs> yeah no i like it too uh, just, just real, is there an example of coaches that either have mutual respect or a pair of coaches that perhaps don't have mutual respect that, uh, that we can, uh, maybe put into our handicapping, maybe just one example. Uh, it would be for the future seasons. I mean, there's no, obviously, you know, no surprise, um, you know, Jimbo and Lane Kiffin, um, <laughs> you know, they're calling each other a clown or joker, you know, depending on what week it is. Um, I think a, a misnomer out there with Kiffin and Saban is I think people feel that there's this disrespect between them that that Saban doesn't like Kiffin. That that's it's totally the opposite. There's a great deal of respect there between those two. Kiffin, you know, he likes to do his thing on Twitter and and have fun like that, but he res he respects Saban more than anything. So you know, future seasons, who knows where Kiffin you know will be coaching in the future, Ole Miss or somewhere else. Um, but I, I don't think Kiffin would would purposely run it up on Saban. If it was Jimbo Fisher, he would run it up and then kick an onside kick and try to score again. <laughs> this one is not coach related, but I know that Pat Fitzgerald has a decapitated monkey in his office uh, that stems from his playing days when they beat Iowa. He does not like Iowa's fans, uh, stemming from like words they said to his kids. That's one that's legitimate. If they had the chance to run it up, if they were good enough to run it up on Iowa, they would. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But like, I think that that aspect to it is uh, definitely exists. So if you know there's a decapitated like stuffed animal in the office, run the run the numbers on that one too, Ed. We'll we'll assign you that All one. Right. There as we go. Well. Love it. Let's dive into some games here for week number 12 and talk about TCU at Baylor. TCU two and a half point favorite here. Total is 57 and a half. And Brad, TCU keeps getting tested. They keep on passing those tests. Can they do it again here on the road against another very good team? As I said, I'm an Oklahoma State guy. I'm a Big 12 guy. I want the Big 12 to get into the playoff. The only way that happens is if TCU runs the table 13-0. I just I just feel at this point, they're you know, we've talked about motivation, emotion. How do you get back? I just feel I don't see how they have anything left in the tank. And maybe we've been saying that for a couple of weeks now, but this is their ninth consecutive game. You know, they've won at Kansas in an incredible atmosphere. They they beat Oklahoma State in a couple of overtimes. They've they've won six straight games by 10 points or less. And now they just beat the biggest, baddest bully on the block in Texas. And don't tell me that didn't have added motivation when Garrett, former TCU coach Gary Patterson was a special assistant or analyst, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> with the Longhorns. Now you have to go at Baylor. Baylor's coming off a loss. Everyone, oh, Baylor's not any good. Um, they're only playing their sixth game of the year, sixth consecutive game, so I don't think they're going to be as beat up. It's their final home game. 
Um, I, I would take the Bears and the points. I just think it's a better spot for them. And at some point, you know, Sonny Dykes has done an incredible job. Incredible. And by the way, I was fortunate slash lucky enough to, to have TCU as a long shot to win the Big 12. So that would turn yes. out great. But I just I just think it's a it's a, another tough spot. Um, at this point, it sounds weird. I don't think TCU is playing to win. I think they're playing not to lose. And I think Baylor will come out with, with nothing to lose and, uh, you know, pull off the upset. Brett, while we're talking about the college football playoff, let's assume TCU goes 12-1, and one, wins the Big 12, uh, and then Michigan loses by seven at Ohio State. Tennessee runs it out. They're 11-1. and one. Who do, who does who does who does and let's assume Ohio State and, and Georgia take care of business. What well, what what do you think happens with the the third and fourth spot? Asking what happened, for a friend here in Ann Arbor. What happens with the the Pac twelve? Is you see is USC twelve and one or did they lose again? Let's just assume they're going to lose. <laughs> okay, so Pac Pac twelve's out of the playoff in that scenario. So it's Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan winner. That's one spot. That's two spot. Uh, Tennessee would be the third spot. Uh, I don't think 12 and one big 12 champ, uh, PCU gets in. So then, yeah, that would open it up for, uh, the Michigan, uh, it missed if Ohio state loses, they, I think they have a better shot because you just look at the non-conference sure. schedule, right. you know, Michigan has, has played, <laughs> they have one win against the top 25 team right now. Right. Yeah. You, you know, uh, so you think Tennessee well, one win Tennessee is ahead of one win Michigan? Oh, sorry, one loss Tennessee is ahead of one loss Michigan. Oh, without a doubt, without a yeah. doubt, because right now they're so close. They're 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 two and one against top not top twenty five teams against top ten teams. Nobody else mm -hmm. has played that schedule. They're yeah. not going to go anywhere. They're going to score, you know, half a hundred their final two games. Um, and again, Michigan a close loss against Ohio state. And then you look at, again, this is how the I've done the mock committees mm -hmm. where you go in and do the selection committee stuff. And it kind of, you look at it a lot differently. I'm not saying it's the right way, but you look at things a lot differently. You look at the things they're looking at and it's almost, you break it down in the simplest terms. I think they would, they would ding Michigan for their non-conference schedule because they didn't play anybody. That's a decision Michigan made. They chose to play UConn. You know, they chose to play, you know, Colorado State. That's that was their choice. Um, yeah, I man, that would be tough. I don't see. I've never thought of the scenario if it's between 12 and one TCU. That means TCU loses to Baylor and then beats somebody in a rematch. I they tend to weigh the conference championships a lot right. more heavily. So that I would probably give a slight lean to TCU. I think of the three, Tennessee's fine, but I, I right. agree with you. I think it would be between TCU and Michigan. Fascinating. Let's uh, talk about that Pac-12 and talk about USC at UCLA. USC right now, a one and a half point favorite total is 75 and a half. That has actually gone up. It was 74 and a half. So that's pretty delightful. USC on the outside looking in right now, but still a shot uh, to get to that college football playoff. UCLA looking for a bounce back here. Who you got coming out on top, uh, USC at UCLA? Yeah, well, somebody somebody on this call, I don't want to say their name, but their initials were Brett McMurphy, was dumb <laughs> enough <laughs> to project UCLA into the college football playoff two weeks ago. Yeah. So, of course, what happens? They they lose to Arizona. I still I still love UCLA this week. Um, I, you know, you, you guys have seen it. USC's defense uh, – I would call it a matador defense, but I want to, you know, immediately apologize to any matadors out there. They can't stop anybody. And, you know, you're not supposed to, you know, I talked about don't listen to the coaches. Yeah. I think you can listen to the players and DTR came out Monday, you know, don't, I guess he didn't read the, uh, the rule book where it says don't trash talk. He's saying, we want to score. We want to hang 60 on USC again. That's what I want to do in the Rose Bowl. Right. I just think UCLA's offense is so good right now. And, yeah, I know they lost to Arizona. Um, that I think they'll they'll handle USC. I don't see any stops in this game. I, I Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the total's crazy, mid-70s. I think it opened 80, 81 or 82, <laughs> and it's dropped down. 
I, I don't see any punts. So you just have to wonder on these fourth downs, are they going right. to convert and score or are they going right. to not make it? And then you've got the link of the field to come back. Uh, but I, I like UCLA in this game. I just think they're better overall. And I think uh, if I am correct, then the Pac-12 will officially be out of the running for the college football playoff. Yeah, Brad. I mean, I actually have UCLA as a slight favorite in this game. Any thoughts on the total? If you don't think there are going to be any punts or stops? <laughs> I, I know it's, big. it's funny. I took, I took over in USC, Arizona and got there. I had over in UCLA, Arizona and did not, did not get there. So man, when it, the totals are this high, like you cannot, you literally have to score every possession, right? Like yeah. if, if there's a turnover deep in a territory, if there's a, a, a missed fourth down conversion, you know, um, Man, I, I think though the emotions and everything. Nobody's going to play slow. They're you know, qu- right. one of the, they're both two of the quicker pace teams in the country. I, I would, if you made me pick a side, I would absolutely take the over because who wants to root an under in USC UCLA when you know there's no defense going to be played? Right, and you also have a probably tight game that could end up in overtime, which certainly absolutely could, certainly yeah. doesn't hurt. But yeah, uh, I, yeah, Ed, I agree with you. I think I think UCLA is the better team than USC until they lost to Oregon, uh, excuse me, Arizona. And on my AP top twenty-five ballot, I had UCLA ranked above USC probably for the last three or four weeks until the loss to Arizona. Awesome. Yeah, we got another fun one. Uh, Utah at Oregon. Uh, Oregon is a three-point favorite. Got a total of sixty-one point uh, five. Man, Oregon. I don't. Even, I don't even. Know, I don't even know what to say about like that game uh, and how they lost that to Washington. You knew. I kind of thought it was a possibility, but then they actually went out and executed. Like I mentioned before, Bo Nix gets hurt, and Oregon runs the ball four straight times uh, with a lack of a first down. So uh, I presume Nix is playing. And what, what do you see in this game against a good Utah team? Yeah, I mean, I I really like Utah. They were my when the when the that they were my choice to win the Pac-12 before the season. I guess they're still alive for that. Um, but I actually like Oregon in this spot as long as Knicks is is 100%. And I don't know, Ed, you guys could maybe tell me, if if Oregon beats Washington, what's what's the line in this game? Is it 5-6, 4-5-6? Yeah, um, maybe. I, I, yeah, I'm guessing it's more than a field goal. So I don't think – Washington beat didn't beat Oregon. Oregon beat itself. Some very aggressive um, play calling by Dan Lanning backfired. You know, if that game's played a hundred times, I think Oregon wins more times than, than, uh, than it loses. And I just think, you know, Oregon's still in a great spot to win this, to get to and win a Pac-12 championship. The, the only concern is, you know, I talked earlier about motivation. Oregon had their sights set on the college football playoff. Even with that loss to Georgia, they were they were running through everybody and knew if they won out, they could get there. Now that the college football playoff is no longer a possibility, is this a big letdown for them? And it, I know you're going to say, how is this a letdown? You're playing for a chance to win the Pac-12 championship. Well, I'm not 18 anymore, so I'm just <laughs> <laughs> remembering how my 18-year-old self would have thought of that. So – I don't love it a lot, but I, I do like Oregon because I think the line's too low as long as Oregon's not flat after the, the Washington loss. Uh, Brett, what what happened with Bo Nix? Like, what, what is your kind of take? I mean, obviously, he wasn't very successful at Auburn, and then you – I mean, he's just after the Georgia game, just absolutely lighting it up. And, and I know they had some pieces on that side of the ball, but I personally didn't see this coming. What What, do, what is your take on it? Yeah, nobody did. I mean, we do on our podcast for the Action Network. We have a you know a bit where we, the home Bo Nix and the road Bo Nix <laughs> and the, the Bo Nix effect. And yeah, and I didn't I didn't see it either. And a lot of people did. And it, sometimes it's just a change of scenery. You get mm-hmm. you get somewhere else. You hear you hear things differently. Somebody may be telling you the same thing, but you hear it differently. It, it and everything just clicks. I mean. You know, look, Michael Penix was incredible at Indiana, but my mm-hmm. God, what he's doing at Washington, like, wh- you know, right. where was that? Is that because he's in an offense that suits him better? Is that the same thing with, with Bo? Um, I, you know, I think maybe there was just so much pressure on him 
right in the SEC that to get away and get up to Oregon, maybe it just it freed him up and he's able to yeah. You know, just... no, I think that contrast is is the perfect one because I'm not surprised at all that Penix is thriving at Washington. Oh, he looks incredible. Yeah. Yeah. I like the first time he threw a ball for Indiana, I was like, this guy, this guy can ball straight ball. And obviously he wasn't successful in all his seasons at Indiana, but like that potential was there. And and Nick's just struggled, right? And and um yeah, I mean it's nice to see him thrive and uh it's just yeah, just want to get your opinion on that because you know if we can put our crystal ball for next season and figure out who the next Bo Nix is going to be yeah. that, that obviously helps yeah. yeah I mean he's obviously d- just so comfortable in that offense and I think probably part of it you know Indiana obviously is ne- <clears throat> their offensive philosophy is never going to be confused with with what Washington does and obviously the the Pac-12 plays more up-tempo more offensive gear type games and that probably played in into it too but yeah he's he is uh he's just been incredible in a in a year with a lot of great quarterbacks Penix is probably you know unfortunately getting overlooked by by a few other guys yeah Bonix went from being fun to watch for one reason to being fun to watch for a very <laughs> different reason this year all right Brad any other bets you're seeing in week 12 that you really like for this week I was trying to think if there's any um any motivational spots? I think there's a, a small one. I don't really love it, love it, but uh, Navy's catching double figures at UCF. Obviously, Navy and the um, academies are always dangerous getting double digit points. And it's not necessarily a play on Navy because they're coming off Notre Dame. So, they're like, well, they're going to be flat. Well, they lost. They've lost a lot this year. It's more a play against UCF. UCF just went to New Orleans, beat Tulane, which was the quasi-American Conference Championship, or at least locking up a bid in the championship game. Now they come home and play a Navy team with seven or eight losses. And next week, they've got rival USF, which maybe it doesn't matter this year because USF <laughs> has been horrid. Um, but I just I, I think Navy will keep this close. Um, UCF has some injury problems at, at quarterback. Do they, do they play conservatively and just think, okay, we need to win two games and then get to the American championship game. Win that we're in the, we're in the cotton bowl. Um, and look, te- we talk about, you know, teams that don't like teams or coaches that don't like coaches other than army. There's not a team out there that's going to try to run it up on the service <laughs> Academy. <laughs> <laughs> so I would I would uh, I would take Navy plus uh, if you're getting more than two touchdowns against uh, against UCF. Yeah, that one is 16 and a half right now at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, Navy plus 16 and a half on that one. Uh, that's definitely a spot where you don't want to can't disrespect the troops too much. That is for <laughs> sure. All right. That is Brett McMurphy. Check him out on Twitter at Brett underscore McMurphy. Find his work over at the Action Network. He talked about the podcast over there. Uh, link to the Action Network is in the show notes over on numberfire.com. Brett, we appreciate the time. It was great to have you on and good luck to you in week 12 and also next week uh, too. You got it, guys. Go Bruins. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Ed, what's going on for you this week at the Power Rank? A lot of football and a lot of football, uh, a lot of World Cup stuff coming in the newsletter, a lot of NFL and college football st- stuff uh, as usual during the heart of football season. Check it all out at thepowerrank.com. And I am on Twitter at Jim Saunders. You can find my work over at numberfire.com. Want to thank you all for tuning in. Back once again tomorrow to break down NFL week number 11. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 